Well, it is so good to see you once again. And if you have those Bibles still open or handy, our sermon scripture is going to be 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And so as you guys make your way throughout your New Testament or look in your, your worship folder this morning, uh, we are picking back up uh, in our 1 Thessalonians sermon series. So way back at the end of September, Pastor Sarah and I launched this series with the intent to preach systematically chapter by chapter through the entire book of 1 Thessalonians as we specifically examine the gospel within the Christian life. And so we've, we've taken a two-week break, and today we're back in it, and the next week we are going to land the plane. And so today we pick up right where we left off at the end of chapter 4 as we were reflecting on the return of Christ in the state of the church and the state of the world on the day that Christ returns. And so there's a lot of ways, a lot of open-handed ways that Christians can think about the end time that don't not make them Christian. Uh, today, we're not going to get into those. We're not going to parse those. We're not going to think about the book of Revelation. We're simply just going to unpack and exposit what Christ has to say to the church in Thessaloniki. And so if you have those Bibles, the first 11 verses of chapter 5, hear the words of St. Paul. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, Thanks be to God and amen indeed. Well, so last May, May of 2022, I found myself on temporary duty at Kent Pendleton in California, uh, the great United States Marine Corps base out there near San Diego. And so when my work was concluded, uh, after about a week and a half of working with the Marine Corps, it was time for me to leave San Diego and return to my base in Kuwait. And so I boarded a 6 a.m. flight on Friday morning. And then three days later, I finally touched down at the Kuwait International Airport on Monday morning at 7 a.m. And over the course of those three days, it was nonstop plane travel and layovers. We went from San Diego to Dallas to London and finally to Kuwait. And so when I arrived, needless to say, my head was spinning and my body didn't know if it was night or day or if it was yesterday or tomorrow. I had jumped 10 hours of head and had only got maybe six hours of sleep between Friday morning and Monday morning. And so when I finally made it to my bed in Kuwait, I slept for 16 hours straight. And of course, the rest of the week was miserable as my body acclimated to the time shift. Because you see, daytime in Kuwait was nighttime in Southern California. And so at work, all I wanted to do was just sleep. But fortunately, that jet lag subsided after about day four. But if any of you have ever done any serious transatlantic or transpacific travel, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because traveling quickly across multiple time zones gets the body's internal clock all out of sync, right? When the sun is shining, but your body is telling you the moon and stars should be overhead, those are some long and hard days. Jet lag is a monster. But in an interesting parallel by analogy, we can easily use the effects of jet lag that I'm sure many of you are familiar with to better understand what Paul's saying here about the state of the church when Jesus returns. You see, in our sermon scripture, Paul assures the Thessalonian Christians that by the nature of them being Christian, they are considered children of light and children of the day. And in pointed contrast, he reminds them that they are not those in darkness or those of the night. Because as with daytime, they, the church, are those who should be awake, sober, and alert. 
For it is at night that people sleep, drink to drunkenness, and remain in a vulnerable stupor. The punch then behind Paul's dichotomy and comparing and contrasting night and day should be obvious to us as we just read the text. If Christians are children of the day and children of the light, then the rest of the world who are not Christian and outside of the church are those of darkness and those of the night. And what this means is that the gospel at work within those who believe on Jesus, the church, the children of the day, the children of the light, that those who believe on Jesus has an awakened soul to life and a godly awareness amidst the world's dark and holy, unholy slumber. And as we just thought a second ago about the effects of jet lag and how it discombobulates the body's internal clock, during those first few nights on a new continent, some of you may know, you're wide awake while everyone else who's conditioned to local time is sleeping soundly in the bed. And you see, that's exactly what happens when an unbeliever comes to faith in Jesus and is spiritually reborn. You see, after a conversion, when they've accepted and trusted the good news of God's yes to them in Christ, they now have a preoccupation and a desire of God that they never had before and begin to reflect God's character throughout the world as he transforms them slowly and surely into the likeness of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the converted Christian's mind and their worldview is completely renewed, translating to different thoughts, words, and actions and all that they do and all that they are in the world because now they have the light of life shining forth in the darkness of the world's spiritual deadness and slumber. That they become, we become, new creatures as we're spiritually reborn as we accept the gospel and watch it begin to work in our lives. Tom Wright, a well-known Bible scholar, he says it much better in this way as he reflects on the words of Paul in our sermon scripture. Tom says, well, says Paul here, talking about the Christians, you are in the middle of the world's night, but the spirit of Jesus within you is telling you it's already daytime. You are children of the day, children of light. God's new world has broken in upon the sad, sleepy, drunken, and deadly old world. That's the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Spirit. The life of the new world breaking into the old. And you belong to the new world, not the old one. You are wide awake long before the full sunrise has dawned. Stay awake then, because this is God's new reality. And it will shortly dawn upon the world. And the dawning that Tom Wright is talking about that will shortly take place upon the whole world is exactly what Paul's focus has been since chapter 4, verse 13, through the end of verse 11 in chapter 5. You see the context as we ended chapter 4 and begin chapter 5. The context has been all about the return of Jesus. That in one event of Christ's return, his church will be gathered to him and he will impartially and righteously judge the whole world. And Paul tells us at verse 2 that this day, the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and intrusively like a thief in the night. In our first scripture reading from Matthew 24, we heard Jesus teach that at his return, it would be like the days of Noah. Remember, Jesus said that before the flood, the people were eating, drinking, marrying, doing life in unawareness up until Noah and his family entered the ark. And then what happened? The flood came and unexpectedly swept them away in judgment. You see, in a serious and fearful call for watchfulness, Jesus then compares the vigilance required to be ready and prepared for his second coming to that of someone who has stayed awake and was ready to prevent the thief from breaking into their house. And that's the very language from Jesus' teaching tradition that Paul is drawing off of in our passage to exhort the Thessalonian church in a right understanding. And you see at verse 4, Paul reminds, assuredly reminds the Thessalonian Christians that as daytime people who live in a nighttime world, that they will not be caught off guard and unprepared to receive the Lord's return. And as we mentioned earlier, Christians are those who are spiritually reborn and renewed in this dark and fallen world. They're the ones with an affection for Jesus who have an awakened desire and preoccupation of Jesus that keeps the soul's focus on Jesus himself above all else. And you see in this beautiful place of new life, an ongoing holy transformation that follows our conversion, the Christian's hope of salvation is predicated on being with the Lord 
at Jesus' return as those saved from God's wrath. This is entirely because of what Jesus has conquered in defeating both sin and death through his own death and resurrection. It's in his victory that Christ affords to us, the believers, the same resurrection victory when he returns and gathers us who have simply repented and believed on him to the end. And it's a simple repentance of turning from the darkness of our previous way of life to the light of Christ's lordship and full surrender and allegiance. That's what we mean by repentance. And then by our faith, it's us trusting and believing that by Jesus' death, we have forgiveness of sins or thereby put in right standing with God and then become part of God's family as those known by him in the name of Jesus. Friends, that is the good and the good news of the gospel. And as we respond to that and live into that, that's what makes us children of the day and children of the light. And you see, when the dawn of Christ's return brings daylight upon this dark and nighttime slumber of the world for the world's judgment, it will be Jesus' church, the Christians, that expects and celebrates that glorious sunrise as it comes with the glory of the Lord for all the world to finally see and know, which comes with our vindication as people who persevered in our faith to the end. That's beautiful, and that's good, and I can't wait to be with Christ as he returns. But there's a tough reality to these words. There's a tough reality that you and I uncomfortably need to reckon with and deal with, because you see many of those in Christ's holy church who would name themselves as Christians are unfortunately and tragically just as asleep as the rest of the secular world. You see, the hard truth is that these people, which may include some of you gathered here today, are just as asleep as those outside of the church. And what I mean bluntly is that we've got so many Christians gathered in our worship spaces on Sunday morning who are nighttime people, not children of the day that marks those in Christ. And you see, for this troubled and lost group, the light of Christ that has awakened and keeps the true Christian soul burning and affectionate interpersonal love of Jesus as their king is either now a small ember that has almost gone extinguished and cold or an entirely dark and cold space that never harbored the light of Christ at all, despite what many may have been deceptively, deceptively perceived to believe. That many of those in our worship spaces, to include some of you, friends, are just as asleep as those who are outside of Christ. And you see, for most of these folks, these people we know, may like, and love dearly because we've been around them so long. These people are more preoccupied with the church than they are with Jesus. They come each week not in the name of Christ, but in the name of religion, in the name of the denomination, or in the name of what's listed on the church sign. And at one time, they may or not have been baptized or received into church membership or made a public profession of faith in Jesus. They may even tithe faithfully in abundance and lead or serve in ministries within the church. But here's the kicker. Regardless, baptism and church membership, serving, tithing, or leading in the church does not make a person a Christian. At a distance, a sleepwalker looks like someone who is awake and coherent. Up and close and personal, though, it's obvious that they're not awake, not alert, and that they are entirely vulnerable. In the same way, just because someone has an active or visible presence in the church, that does not guarantee that they will not be caught tragically and unexpectedly on the day of the Lord as those not gathered with Christ, but as those judged with the rest of the world that's spiritually dead and asleep. I don't want you to mishear me. I'm talking this way and I've gone this way because I love you dearly. I'm not mad or upset with you. I'm not trying to address a collective problem that I see But Pastor Sarah and I always have an anxious concern for your spiritual well-being. And we believe that it's not our job to intentionally try and fearfully convict you in any way. Thankfully, we leave that up comfortably to the role, to the person and work of the Holy Spirit to fearfully convict you. But Pastor Sarah and I believe that it is our duty and our diligence to ensure that you understand what the Christian faith is and is not because of the eternal consequences that go with understanding what it means to be a Christian and what it does not mean to be a Christian. Because for the vast majority of you, as well as with me and Pastor Sarah, most of us inherited the church when we were born. We were born into the church. 
And whether that was good or bad or indifferent, we were raised in greater or lesser degrees as those who were taken to church and instructed to be a part of the church. And there's nothing wrong with being raised in church. But the problem is that being born in the church does not produce automatic spiritual rebirth as Christians. Being born into the church does not automatically make one a Christian. You see, if the faith of our parents or of the church that raised us or of the denomination or the great theological traditions that we hold dear to us never becomes our own at some point in life, friends, we never become genuine Christians in this life, even if we've had a lifetime spent in church buildings. You see, unfortunately, what this tragic ignorance creates is an army of people that are on the church membership roll and warm a pew every Sunday, whose only power in the Christian faith is simply that of what others say and believe, not their own. You see, the true power of Christ given through the presence of the Holy Spirit that brings about a real supernatural ability to resist and overcome sin, the remarkable sense of real purpose in this life, and a joyful assurance of a soul that is well in the love of God amid life's pain and brokenness is not known personally for those who have never repented and believed on Christ alone for their salvation, for the here and today as well as the then and tomorrow. Sadly, these people, instead of being in Christ, are simply in church. And until the in-church people hear and genuinely respond to the good news of Jesus through repentance and faith and become those in Christ. They can never exist as the church in any real tangible manner that God expects and equips the church to be. And this is what I mean. I want you to think about it. How can a local church fulfill the great commission by making disciples if they've not been authentic learners or disciples of Jesus themselves? Or how can the local church meet the criteria of the great commandment by loving the world as Jesus loves if they've not experienced the personal love of Jesus dawn upon their heart in any transformative manner? The answer to both of those questions is the church cannot. They are unable. Not too long ago, I I had a conversation with a man in church uh, who was frustrated that he was unable to share the gospel with others in any articulate manner or what he deemed as an effective manner. Now, this guy, faithfully devoted man of God, there's no doubt in my mind that on the day of the Lord, he's going to be with his Lord. But he was desperate in wanting to give Jesus to other people. But he said in moments of talking with strangers, he simply forgot. His mind went blank, the great and profound passages of Scripture that articulate what is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so in that conversation, I gently encouraged him that reciting Scripture verbatim or expounding in technical detail the seven theories of atonement theology at the Piggly Wiggly checkout line is not the only way or probably the most effective way to give someone the good news of Jesus. What can be more effective and easier is to do what I told him, is to share where and how Jesus has been at work in your own life. That's how you give Jesus and the gospel to people. To share the why and the how of how your life is different under the lordship of Jesus compared to what your life looked like when it was aligned with the world under the lordship of the world. You give Jesus where he has healed and saved you to the world. And then the world sees the gospel at work in you and they're more apt to respond in a real interpersonal human way. And you see, after our conversation, the gentleman kind of felt the weight of undue pressure lift off his shoulders because for him, sharing Jesus now seemed a little more doable and attainable than trying to emulate Paul or Billy Graham or John Wesley out there at the Piggly Wiggly. The point, though, is that you can only give people Jesus in a personal, tangible manner if you've only at first experienced Jesus' giving of himself to you in a real, personal manner. And that is the converted life versus the inherited church life. The term for those who are simply in the church and not in Christ is what we call nominal Christianity, friends. It means Christian in name only because for those people, there is no real faithful devotion or genuine affection for Jesus. Yet they claim the church, not necessarily Christ, as a form of influence in their life. You see, for the nominal Christian, they have wrongly and falsely promoted a party line that says church membership Church attendance, church tithing, and church volunteering are what make the person a Christian, not faith 
on the broken body and shed blood of the ascended and reigning Christ as Lord of the world. And friends, I'm here to tell you, I'm here to warn you, don't believe the lies of that false party line because it will only provide you a false sense of peace and security in your Christian life. In verse 3, Paul cites the phrase peace and security. And that was a prevalent Roman emperor party line of bringing peace and security across the Roman Empire that was everywhere. And it would have been a phrase and a term that the Thessalonians were widely familiar with relative to the military and political forces that controlled their world. But for Paul, it is those in the dark world trusting on a form of false peace and security from the world itself that are the ones who will be caught unexpected in sudden destruction at the return of Jesus. And that's important for us to think about and grasp because only those in Christ are the ones gathered to Christ at his return. The only peace and security Christians are guaranteed is God's promise of salvation for us as we believe on and trust in Jesus for our peace and security. Nothing else and no one else. And what that means is that simply being in the church and preoccupied with the church in the name of Christianity does not afford you promises of eternal security with Jesus. Only the gospel's promise of being in Jesus by repentance and faith gives you assurance and security. Any party line or storyline that claims peace and security for the Christian that is not Christocentric, Christ-centered, is a misrepresentation of the gospel and misunderstanding of the gospel and a contortion of scripture. And if this word and if this message has challenged you today or frightened you today or served as a wake-up call for you today, I want to assure you that you should find joyful encouragement and hope in the reality that the night of your life is not too far gone to respond to the light of the impending dawn that the whole world will once and soon behold in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And so you can respond in the first time today or you can recommit yourself to the faith that once burned strongly and passionately in affectionate love that is somehow simmered and cooled to a glowing ember that's about to go out. And if you want to respond to the gospel for the first time today or recommit and rededicate yourself to the gospel that was once at work in your life that made you a child of the light and of the day, friends, it's a simple matter of repenting from your current allegiances to the world to surrendering allegiance to Jesus as the Lord of your entire life and then believing in your faith that Jesus gave his very self doing what you could never do for your forgiveness of sins so that you would have hope of new life to be in relationship with God till the end of this age and into the next. And so, friends, if the Spirit is leading and convicting and prompting you to go to the Lord in prayer, I encourage you before you leave this moment of worship that you indeed lay your soul before Christ and receives God's yes to you in his name. Let us go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the precious good news that is your son. And Lord, my hope and my prayer, God, is that you would use this word, that you would use this sermon to stir the hearts and souls of all who are gathered here in worship today, that you would draw them into a greater affectionate love of you for the first time or in a greater way as they go forth into this world as your ambassadors in this world, God, that you would bring those to faith who are not of the faith, God, and that you would strengthen those who have strayed from the faith and whose faith have waned. God, that your spirit would burn their hearts once again in affectionate holy love for all that you are. In Jesus, our Lord, who has made us right with you and has given us life to be for and with you in this world. And it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen.